Well, let's jump right in. Uh, today we're getting into the heavy, heavy part of Genesis. We're getting into the curse. Nobody likes that word, but, but that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the word, the word, the curse. Um, that when you when I just throw out the word curse, that doesn't seem very applicable. Uh, like that's not really for me or about my life or what I'm going through. But I think as we jump in today, you're going to realize, wow. What we're talking about today is really applicable. It really does relate to my life. I want to start by reading you a story. I read this story this weekend um, on foxnews.com. It was written uh, October 6th, which was yesterday, by Joshua Rogers. And it's kind of an op-ed piece or a human interest piece. He's talking about himself. And the title of this story is... My wife and I thought we knew each other, then this happened. Joshua Rogers writes, It was our second year of marriage, and my wife wanted me to cook, or else. And she wanted me to do it with a good attitude. And that's asking a lot. I don't like cooking as it is, And I sure don't like cooking when I feel like I'm being forced to do it. Raquel, that's his wife, Raquel was pretty sick though, so I felt obligated to do it. Rather than check out like I normally do when she was ill. That's how I ended up standing over a pot of boiling water, lowering raw chicken, into it with a bad attitude. What's next? I asked Raquel. Read the recipe. It says add salt. Then add salt, she said. It doesn't say how much. Just put some salt in your hand and add it, she said, walking away. I picked up the salt canister, filled my hand with salt, and dumped it in the pot. Then I bitterly chopped the vegetables and threw them in, in, into the pot as well. That was the last step, and I was just glad it was over. But it wasn't over at all. A couple of hours later, Raquel took a spoon and tasted the soup. Then she spat it into the sink. <clears throat> My goodness, Joshua, it tastes like salt water. I'm sorry, I said starting to get even more irritated, but you said to put some salt in my hand and add it, so I did. How much did you put into your hand, Joshua? I cupped my hand and I filled my hand up to the top. What? That's probably a quarter of cup of a cup of salt, Joshua. What were you thinking? Raquel was furious with me. And she was convinced I had ruined the soup on purpose. I defended myself and blamed her for being unclear. Deep in my heart, though, I knew I had passively, aggressively oversalted the soup. She had called me out and she had exposed my immaturity for what it was. Before I was married, I could usually keep people from seeing my worst, and in doing so, I could avoid rejection. It's a survival skill, and it's one that keeps others at a safe and a comfortable distance. But then we get married, and somebody moves into our space, and they begin to see us for who we really are. The ugly side of us begins to creep out. And that's the end of, the, of, of Joshua's story. Um, now this, this, this ugly side that begins to creep out, even if you've never been married, you've been in close relationships where that happens. The ugly side begins to creep out. And what is that ugly side that begins to creep out? Well, sometimes in the church, sometimes in Christianity, we call it the curse of sin. And that's what we're talking about today, the curse of sin. 
Let's jump into our Genesis passage. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 9. I'll read out long, out loud, rather. You follow along. Beginning with verse 9 of Genesis 3, it says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? That's where we ended yesterday, or last week, with Adam and Eve having sinned and the Lord God looking for them in the garden. So the Lord God calls out, Where are you? And Adam, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of, uh, of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. And I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, or strife, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It's a really odd statement. We'll talk about that later or in a few minutes. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you, uh, which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of, uh, out of it you were taken, uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now now lest he reach out his hand and, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Um, Therefore, the Lord God said, uh, sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, let's just agree that this is a weird story. There are, especially the ending, we don't quite get. All we know is they were once welcome in the Garden of Eden and in a welcome relationship with God, and now they've been kicked out. They have been sent away. They are no longer welcome in this close-knit relationship of the Garden. We'll talk more about the end of this story in a few weeks. But for today, we're going to primarily cover the beginning. So, today highlights something. Today begins with with, with a God who curses. Today, uh, it, it highlights a desire in every one of us to overlook sin, to 
make light of sin to say it's not that big of a deal. And, and yet we're confronted with a God who curses. And why does God curse in this passage? Because God hates sin. He can't stand it. God is, is holy to the extent that he can't even stand to be around sin. That's why he has to send Adam and Eve out of relationship. God hates sin. It's an affront to his holiness. Think on this. God hates sin to the extent that he chose to sacrifice Jesus on the cross to cancel it out. God hates sin way more than I do. Way more than you do. You want to know God's heart. That's it. I have people from time to time say, I really want to know God's heart. That's God's heart. He is holy to, to an extreme degree, such that he can't even stand to be around sin. And today's passage becomes even more intriguing because in it we see the origin of this age old conflict between uh, man and woman. This, this ancient conflict between husband and wife that, that most of us know all too well. So the, 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 drama, uh, the drama starts with an excuse. So we're going to talk about that right now. The drama starts with an excuse. Uh, how does this excuse first, uh, it, how is it first expressed? Well, here's what happened. It happens. God comes, uh, he finds Adam, and he says this. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And Adam says, the woman? You know the woman, the one you gave me? She gave me the fruit to eat. And, and if someone's going to die for this, it better be her. Right? And, and, and ever, since, uh, ever since that day, uh, men have been th throwing women under the bus. Blaming women. Allowing women to take the blow, to, to take the fall. Men have been throwing, throwing, throwing women under the bus ever since. Do you, do you throw, don't out dent out loud, and, and wives, please don't elbow, but do you throw your wife under the bus at times? Allow her to take the blame for something that really she doesn't deserve. Do you treat your, uh, the women in your life with callous brutality? As we unpack this story today, what we're going to realize is that's part of the curse of sin. We've been doing this for a long time, men. Men behaving badly could be the, the, the subtitle of a book about the history of humanity. Regarding recent events, uh, you know, some people say that this is the year of the Me Too movement, right? And we're not going to talk about politics. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with talking about politics, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, what I want to talk about is the recent, recent Me Too movement in 2018 in our country. And, and I, will, I, will agree, I will agree with the sentiment that goes something like this. It's, it's, it is sad when even uh, one man is falsely accused. Um, that, but let's, let's be honest. I mean, we know what's been going on since the beginning of time. Let's be honest. Men being falsely accused is not prevalent. And historically, it's not, it's not prevalent. And, and it's not a growing threat for men like you and me. But the assault of women, the, the brutal treatment of women, that's common. The, the, the rape... And, and, and the assault and, and, and misogyny and, and, and stereotype, it, it, it's an age-old sin. And it has no place in God's kingdom. 
a, na- a, natural attendant, a natural tendency that we as men have toward brutality. God hates the brutal treatment of women. And, and it began right here in this story in the Garden of Eden. And we've had a tendency toward that, men, ever since. Now, it helps us, I believe, uh, and, and we're going to get to you women as well, but it, it helps us to, to, it helps us to realize what our natural, broken, cursed tendencies are. Because then we can step back and say, I don't want to be like that anymore. I'm going to follow Jesus now. I want the Holy Spirit to root that sin out of my life. My daughters have helped. I have two daughters. They have helped me in recent months and maybe the last year or two realize some of the, the, the natural, brutal tendencies that I have with words like, like, Dad, just because you can talk faster and just because you can talk louder and just because you think you're super logical with your words does not make you right all the time. And that's true. But with my brutality, I tend to set myself up as though I'm right all the time. With my supposed super logical ways, I can be a brutal person. So we, we do this. We throw women under the bus. We blame them for everything. Even when they're victimized, you've seen this. Even when they're victimized, we have a history of blaming them for that also. So, so, so the excuse leads to what we're going to talk about next, and that is the consequence. There are several consequences that are passed out, that are doled out, Another word for this would be the curse. We talk, we talk in Christian circles and even within just culture, within culture from, from time to time we'll talk about, oh yeah, the curse of sin. You know, and so we'll say, well, the, the curse of sin is work. And you've heard me say over the last few weeks, that's not true. Uh, work is not a curse. Work was not a result of the fall of man. Work has never been a curse. God has never said that you, your curse is that you have to work. No, Adam and Eve were supposed to work the garden before sin ever came. But there are curses that are handed out. The consequence of sin, the power of sin over our lives. God hands out, doles out consequences. Listen, there, there are always, always consequences to sin. We, we know that. We know that intuitively. Uh, God forgives. God forgives a broken and contrite spirit. God gives grace to the humble. He draws the humble to himself. But nonetheless, we live in a world, we live in a system where there are consequences. And in in the Garden of Eden, there were consequences. And we need to be delivered. We need to be praying that the Holy Spirit would deliver us from these consequences. That he would root the sin out of our lives, uh, the power of sin in our lives. I'll tell you a story. A few years, a number of years ago, uh, it wasn't at River Church. You don't know this per- these people, but uh, uh, a number of years ago, uh, I, 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 there, were, there, there were these people, these former church, these people that came to our church, and they'd been at a former church. They came to my church. They used to go to another church, and, and in, at that church, they had... Um, they had stolen from the offering plate. And they told me that, and I knew that, and so now they're at, at this church. Uh, not River Church, but they were at, at, at my church. And, and they arrived, uh, and within a few months, uh, they wanted to know, this couple, they wanted to know if, if they could be the offering counters at the church. And I said, no, 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 sorry. Uh, God forgives sins, uh, but we're not going to trust you with money right now. You lose that kind of, that kind of opportunity, and, 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 and maybe that doesn't seem fair, but that's just the consequence of your sin, which has been forgiven as you have repented of that sin, because sin always has consequences. So, the first consequence that, that, that uh, God doles out, hands out, is to the serpent. Uh, because of what you've done, this serpent, 
He, the serpent is now cursed above all liar existence. And I really don't even know exactly what that means. Uh, it doesn't relate to us because we're not serpents. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think about how everybody hates snakes. And if you love snakes, we think you're kind of weird because everybody hates snakes. And I don't know if that's part of the curse that was doled out that day or not, but we're going to move on to the woman and the man. So to the woman, the consequence of her choice, and remember we talked about this last week, here's what her choice really was. God said either I will be God or, or you eat from that fruit and you take a shot at being your own God. Either, either I will rule the day, God says, either I will reign supremely in your life, or you go ahead and eat that fruit and, and run your own show. Be your own God. Do your own thing. And so that's what they, they, the, the serpent told them, you'll be like God. You'll know right from wrong. You'll be wise. And so they, they bit into that piece of fruit. And now God says, the consequence of your choice in wanting to be like me, the first consequence, and you ladies, you mamas especially, you know this real well, you shall experience deep pain in childbearing. I'm not going to unpack that because you know what that is. It doesn't really need a whole lot of explaining. And I've never experienced it firsthand. So all I can ever say when we deal with that issue is, Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for bearing children, even though you have to go through so much extreme pain. We owe a debt of gratitude for you. I owe a debt of gratitude to my wife, who's given me five beautiful children, and my mother, who brought me into this world. Thank you. There's another consequence that God doles out in this story, and this is the wording. Um, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. I think that wording, which is most familiar to me, comes uh, from the New American Standard. The wording that I read this morning from the uh, English Standard Version says this. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now that, that's a, that is a, a, a much less discussed uh, curse of sin. We, we know full well the curse of the pain of childbearing. But what is God talking about here when he says, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. In other words, you're going to have this sinful desire to, to be the boss of your husband and, and to say, if you're not going to run the show, I'm going to run the show. You're going to have this sinful desire to be the boss over your husband and he is going to sinfully and brutally rule over you in response. Does that sound familiar? How prophetic. Um, in the average Christian home, and I get to peek into, peek through the windows, uh, not in a weird sort of way, but you, like I get to peek through the, in, into the window of many Christian homes because I hear your stories and you come to me and, and, I, and I hold those with confidence. But what I, can, what I can say is that in the average Christian home, there is this constant power struggle. Who's the boss and why isn't it me, right? There's a constant power struggle. The wife wants to stand up to the man, and the man who's usually more capable in the brute strength category, not always, but usually, uh, he, he, he wants to knock her down, put her in her place. I will rule over you. And that's the sin. That's the brokenness. That's the curse. It's the consequence. And then to the man, the, consequence, the, the, the consequences that are, that are handed out to the man. Your consequence, because of your choice, your, your desire to be God. 
Well, number one, it's this. You will make a living by the sweat of your brow. But that doesn't mean exactly what we think it means because most men in this room, um, and women as well, because m- many of you or most of you work outside of the home. You all work in- inside the home. Uh, this, this phrase, you will make a living by the sweat of your brow, it doesn't mean exactly what we think it does. Because here's the truth. M- most of us, men and women, we enjoy a little sweat. We enjoy a hard day's work. We enjoy putting in some hard work and seeing the sweat and getting paid as a result. What God is saying here is that work is going to, ha- is going to be harder than it has to be. It's going to be incredibly frustrating. The ground will be hard and, and the rain won't come when you need it. And you'll, you'll, you'll go home some days and say, what a wasted day it was. If I could sort of, sort of uh, quote Garth Brooks, he's got a song where he says, darn this rain and darn this wasted day. All right, and that's what God is saying. It's important for us to realize work is not a curse. That wouldn't be further from the truth. Work is not a curse. Bringing order out of chaos, that's, that's work. We love that. But God says, Man, you're going to be frustrated. And if there, if there, are, if there's, I'm going to give you two big statements that really sum up all of our problems as men. And one of a, one of our main problems as men is that we're we're frustrated. The frustrated man. I, I deal with I deal with the frustrated man all the time. I'll tell you. I'll give you. I'm about to go here, so I tell you what the other the other man that I that I deal with all the time is the man who no one follows. And, and, and if, if I could sum up, man, all of your problems, I, everything that you bring to me, uh, all of, the, all of the, 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 the depressed moments in my life, it, it, they've revolved around these two, uh, these two big statements. Most of us, I'm going to say all of us as men, we deal with this. Number one, the frustrated man. Like, like things don't go well for me at work. I don't, I don't get just reward uh, for my hard work. No one knows how valuable I am to this company. The, the frustrated man, it's, he's a, he is alive and well in all of us. But the other, the other, the other man that is alive and well in all, in all of us, that frustrates us, uh, is the man who no one follows. That's the other curse that I see in today's passage. The first curse, again, is, Jesus, is God says, you will, you will work, you will make, uh, make a living by the sweat of your brow. Meaning it's going to frustrate you to no end. The second curse is you will, be, you will um, brutally lead and others will not want to follow. We see that implied in the description of the woman's consequences. That is a curse that we don't talk about very often, but it's a curse that we as men have received. You're going to have this natural tendency to, yes, to lead, but the sinful aspect of it is you're going to lead brutally. And then what's so frustrating is no one will follow me. In many Christian homes, and even in the church, we call on men to lead, but we call on men to lead with the wrong motives, with this like macho motive, like you're a man, you're supposed to lead, get up and lead. And I'm I'm convinced that we have an epidemic of men in the church who are not ready to lead who are not able to lead, who have no business leading, just because you're a man you get to lead is, 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 a, uh, is an approach uh, that is based on some wrong motives, macho motives. Men, you are not the God-given boss of everybody in the sense that you are to be respected without earning that respect. 
And that's what God is saying here. That one aspect of the curse of sin is that you're going to try to lead and no one's going to follow you. Which means you're not leading. You're just taking a walk, right? Uh, you, the curse, this curse highlights the fact that, that we have a, a culture of men who feel disrespected. Tell me if that doesn't sound familiar to you. We have a culture of men who feel disrespected by their kids. We have a culture of men who feel disrespected by their wife. We have a culture of men who feel disrespected by the boss at work. And in many cases, the man has not acted respectfully. He really doesn't deserve respect. And God says that is the curse of sin. The woman will desire to control the man, and he, the man, will brutally rule over her. Is that you, man? Or men? Can you relate to one or both of these ideas? Are you, are you the man who, who, who tries to lead and no one follows? Are you the frustrated man? I hate my job. I hate my direction in life. I have no career. I hate my career. Could have been somebody. I wanted to be the president. I didn't even go to a very good college. Oh. Which leads to the new normal. The new normal. And, and so the new normal is sad. The new normal is sad. The new normal, uh, that's what we have here. The new normal is this. God made clothes to cover their nakedness. They used to be naked and, and unashamed, you know. Like my two-year-old who runs around the corner when we have company and he's got, he's got nothing he's ashamed of, right? He's just happy with life. But now... Now, the new normal is God makes clothes because not just physically. In fact, we're not really mostly talking physically. There's nakedness and there's shame. There's a sense of, don't come in here. I'm changing. In other words, you can't see me as I really am. We're hiding. We're covering. It's the new normal. So God makes clothes to cover their nakedness and then God kicks them out of the garden and God creates space between Himself and humanity. God sent them away. He, he couldn't be around them. 1 John 1 says this, God is light. In God there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. What's this about? It's, it's about the fact that God is holy. In Him, there is no sin. And He cannot be around sin. So He, he sends them away. And we are now a people who are sent away. That happened long ago. We are, we are born separate from God. There's this distance. There's this chasm because the curse of sin. So this is now the new normal. This was not always the normal. This is not what Adam and Eve were created into. This for us is the new normal. So we are, I'll give you two, two, concept, two, two, two of the new normals for us. One is we're, we're naked and ashamed. In other words, we're, we're guarded. We're, we're unwilling to be transparent. We're not going to be honest. I'm going to ask you how you're doing. You're going to say just fine. You're going to ask me how I'm doing. I'm going to say just fine. And you're going to go home and you're going to be like that with your spouse. You're going to be like that even with your best friend or your, your, or your brother or your sister. In, in your closest of relationships, you're still going to be ashamed. You're still going to be guarded. You're still going to have that attitude. Don't come in here. I have to fix myself up first. I can't be real. I can't be transparent. That's one 
of the new normals for us. And the other new normal is we're a people without a home. Here's what I mean by that. We feel alone wherever we go, in a crowded group, among friends. We feel alone. We feel isolated. I've, I've, I've always been intrigued when I read stories about, about what it's like to live in Manhattan and how people can live in a city of millions and yet they feel completely alone, completely isolated. It's kind of a metaphor for this picture of how God sent humanity out of the garden and we have been a people without a home ever since. So that's all the bad news, but don't let that fool you into believing that God was giving up on humanity. Don't let what we've just read and talked about fool you into believing that that he just threw up his hands and he said, I have no more plan. There's no second chances. No, he he, he already had a rescue mission in place. God was already working on this rescue mission. The last thing we're going to talk about today is that it doesn't have to be like this. Yes, that's the new normal, but it doesn't have to be like this. Let's go back to what God said to the serpent. I humorously said that, you know, the the curse of slithering around on his belly, I don't really understand that, and and that's not really for us. Uh, But there is a profound statement made by God at that moment that I want to highlight right now. I think we have this verse. He says to the serpent regarding this future human, this future male that's yet to to come into the picture. He says this, He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus He is Jesus, the God-man who crushed the serpent's head. Jesus is saying, uh, or God is saying, I will send the God-man. I will will send Jesus. You just wait, Satan. I will send the God-man. I will send Jesus to the earth. And yes, you will bruise his heel, meaning you'll crucify him. But he will crush your head, meaning he will deal with with the sin problem. This separation, us being sent away from God, us being born with this this distance between us and God, God here is saying, Jesus deals with that. Jesus deals with the curse of sin. Jesus crushes the serpent's head. That was part of the curse that was laid on the serpent. You see, the worst curse of all we were cursed as men, we were cursed as, you were cursed as women, but the worst curse of all time was the curse God put on Jesus for our sins. Galatians chapter 3 says this, Christ redeemed us from our curse, from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. What it's saying is that the curse that we have incurred, that we have received, the curse of sin is now lifted off of us because Jesus took it on himself. He became for us a curse so that we no longer are cursed. He took, him, took upon himself our curse, so that we might be delivered. Here's the point. Your life doesn't have to be ruled by the curse of sin any longer. Men and women, this this constant antagonism, this fight for control, this tendency that we have towards sin, not just in marriage, but life in general, this constant vine for power and control, Christ has broken that power of sin in your life. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. 1 Peter 2 says this, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, that we might die to sin 
and live to righteousness. For we were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the overseer of our souls. Again, the point is, your life doesn't have to be ruled by sin or by the curse of sin any longer. There's a song that we used to sing a long time ago. I'm going to attempt to sing this for you. I, I like to sing for you every once in a while, but I want you actually to sing, sing with me as soon as you kind of catch on or if you remember it. It goes like this. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in Thee. Let the water and the blood from Thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Thank you for singing with me. What does this what do the last two lines say? Be of sin the double cure. Top Lady, a fellow by the name of Top Lady, he wrote this hymn. It's a beautiful theological truth. He's saying, Jesus, you're, you're the rock of ages. I, I can find my rest in you. Uh, in your blood, in your work on the cross, be for me the double cure for sin. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean that we would need a double cure? Not just one cure, that's not enough. We need a double cure cure from our sin. What is he talking about? What he means is this. We need to be cured of the curse of sin. Yes. In other words, my sin, your sin, has exposed us to God's divine wrath. God hates sin. We are the rightful recipients of His wrath. Jesus deals with that. He, he delivers us from, from the curse of sin, from the penalty of sin, but that's not enough. We need more than that. We don't just need forgiveness. We don't just need to be delivered from the penalty of sin. We need to be delivered from the power of sin. This tendency to just, just keep on sinning after Christ has moved into our hearts, after He has delivered us from the... Some of us in this room today, sin still has great power over us. And what Top Lady is writing here is, God, don't just, don't just cure me from your wrath, from the penalty of sin. Make me pure. Don't just deliver me from the penalty of sin. Deliver me from the power of sin. That's who Jesus is for you. Christ came to deliver you from the power of sin. Those of you who have believed in Jesus are no longer slaves. You're no longer slaves to the power of sin for one reason and one reason alone. Christ's death on the cross. You're, you're no longer, you're no longer um, recipients of the penalty of sin. In other words, you won't go to hell when you die. You don't, have to, you don't have to experience God's wrath for eternity. For one reason, Jesus' work on the cross. But, but also, you no longer are subject to the power of sin. You don't have to keep sinning. You, you're, not, you're not a slave to sin any longer. Also, for one reason, Christ's work on the cross. Here's the problem. We tend to believe that Christ's death and burial and resurrection has set us free from the penalty of sin, the wrath of God, and then we take advantage of that idea and we just tend to live however we please. Now, Jesus wants to deliver you today not only from the penalty of sin, 
but from the power of sin. So let me ask you in your own life, how, is, how does sin have power today? What's going on in your life? What, in what areas have you just lived defeated? In what areas have you just given Satan permission, volunteered, uh, uh, given him the opportunity to, to, to rule and reign in your life, even though he has no real authority, even though he has no real power? Christ died on the cross today to deliver you from the penalty of sin, yes, but also from the power. If you would bow your heads with me, let's, let's pray silently for a moment.